Hello, and welcome to Windows and Time, the Simi side of Medford, 1884 to 1935, presented by Jackson County Library Services and the Southern Oregon Historical Society. I am Leah Pastizo, Digital Services Specialist. This program is being recorded, so please mute your microphone and turn off your camera to ensure quality recording. There will be a time to answer your questions at the end of the program. Jackson County Library Services acknowledges that its libraries are located within the traditional lands of the Shasta, Tekelma, and Makawa people, whose descendants are now identified as members of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians and Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, as well as the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua Tribe of Indians and Modoc Nation, who were forced to relocate to Oklahoma. The result of forced relocation and genocide is that Jackson County is no longer a population center for these specific tribal groups. As of the 2020 census, 4.6% of the population of Jackson County has some indigenous heritage. While this is more than twice the national average, it is a precipitous reduction from the pre-colonial 100%. We acknowledge that indigenous groups are too often relegated to the historical past when, in truth, Indigenous people are essential members of the Jackson County community. We take this moment to recognize the Indigenous peoples who tr whose traditional homelands and hunting grounds are where residents of Jackson County live today. We encourage you to learn about the land you reside on and to join us in advocating for the inherent sovereignty, sovereignty of Indigenous people. The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of Jackson County Library Services. Well, good afternoon. I'm Larry Mullally, and I'm very happy to be here to introduce our speaker and say a few words about the co-host of the event, which with the Jackson County Library Services is the Southern Oregon Historical Society. The Southern Oregon Society summer programs are about to begin and their normal event is something called Summer Thursdays at Hanley Farm. Hanley Farm is this classic early settled farm uh, near Jacksonville that is a gem of the county and has tours and is open for visitors every Thursday night, every Thursday evening from four to 8 p.m. Uh, at the center of it is the Hanley House, which dates to 1876 and for an admission price of $5 for children or under 12 and for adults at 10, uh, you'll be able to enter another world. Uh, the areas of different rooms are, are marked out, uh, all with original furniture, wonderful stories, and it, it's just a lovely place to go and, and visit the farm, but also just to see the beautiful grounds there in its park-like setting. Our speaker today, is Ben Truey. Ben Truey is a well-known historian of Southern Oregon. He is the author of Southern Jackson County, the early years, 1800 to 1939, looking back. And he is a volunteer at the Southern Oregon Historical Society Library, where he has made a considerable contribution in the areas of film, photographic records, and documentation. And he's one of the several volunteers that are happy to assist any of you coming there uh, during hours to open it up. With that, I present to you Ben Truy. So, yeah, I, as usual, uh, well, I guess I should also thank the Southern Oregon Historical Society and the Jackson County Library System and uh, welcome you all to this talk about on the seamy side of Medford which will actually be a glimpse into the underworld of Jackson County, not just Medford. But Medford was the political, cultural, and economic center of the Valley for all of the last century. So it's to be expected that Medford was the vice center as well. But if you're at home watching uh, from an outlying community, don't feel too virtuous because that just means that the residents from your town had to travel to Medford for their weekly taste of sin. And as usual, I'm going to start my talk with uh, my web address on the screen now, where you'll find well over a thousand pages of Jackson County history, 
including transcriptions of all the original documents that uh, are the source for this afternoon's talk. So if you'll all just please go online and read all thousand pages, you will all know much more, more about Jackson County history than I do. And I won't need to show up for my next talk. There's nothing on the screen. We publicized this, this talk with, uh, with this picture, which was taken in 1914. But uh, I did walking tours for 20 years in which a major feature was vice during this period, during the orchard boom. And I'm kind of done with that. So the saloons I'm going to be talking about today look more like this. Today, I'm going to be talking about vice in the post-World War II era. And a word of caution, I'm going to be illustrating this talk with a series of photographs that were taken in Medford saloons in February of 1949, apparently as part of a vice survey. But if an accompanying report was uh, produced in 1949, I haven't been able to locate it. If any of you out there have it, please let me know. And, or if you have any photo photographs or documents on the post-war period, please uh, let me know or bring it into the Historical Society. We have a shortage of hard data on this period. But more about these pictures. At this remove, 70 years after these pictures were taken, we, we don't know the names of any of the people in these pictures. And we only know the names of a, of a few of the bars pictured. And we certainly don't know anything about the proclivities of the people in these pictures. So please don't take it personally if I read something awful, and I will be reading awful things while showing a picture of mom or dad. <laughs> And if you do happen to recognize any of these people or, or the locations, please let me know. So on to the talk. As I said, I'm going to be talking mostly about the post-war period, the late 1940s and into the 1950s. And as anyone born after the baby boom knows, any documentary or sitcom will tell you that this was the happy-go-lucky, oops, sunshiny, conformist world of Leave it to Beaver. And the documentaries will all tell you this was a simpler time. But just you know, think about it for a moment. That, that world didn't really exist. There are no simple times. If a time seems simple in retrospect, it's only because we have bad memories. I'm going to be talking about the real world the baby, baby, the baby boomers were born into. So in 1953, we had a brand new Jackson County District Attorney, Walter Nunley. Mr. Nunley had been elected on a platform to clean up Jackson County, especially by eliminating gambling, even social gambling, which was illegal in the state until 1973. He promised to actually start enforcing Oregon's anti-gambling laws. It was, it was true that it wasn't hard to find a poker game in town, and many restaurants and bars had a couple of slot machines openly displayed. Pinball games, or some of them, paid off in cash or tokens. And there was a sneaking suspicion that being rewarded with a free game by playing pinball was putting the youth on the slippery slope to the gambling den. Nunley had performed his own personal inspection tour of the bars and nightclubs of Jackson County and professed to be shocked, shocked at the disregard for state gambling statutes. So during his 1952 campaign, the incumbent DA, the guy Nunley was, Nunley was running against, pointed out that he'd prosecuted every gambling case that had come across his desk and tried to point out that the district attorney's case district attorneys try cases, they don't investigate them. But Nunley promised that when he won, he was going to change all that. The law is the law. And gambling was a crime against morals. And Nunley's campaign apparently resonated with voters. He won. And after he won, he decided very quickly to hire a private investigator to help wake up Jackson County to the growing menace of vice. He hired a Californian named Walter Scott Jeffries, who described himself as a crime and police efficiency expert. 
and Jeffries was going to infiltrate Jackson County, the underworld, and put the community's fears on a factual basis. And boy, did Nunley get what he paid for. This Jeffries produced a report that paints a world that looks more like a film noir than anything in the real world. I like to picture Jeffries as a discount Humphrey Bogart, fending off the harlots and degenerates in downtown Medford as he feverishly scribbles notes. But do keep in mind as I read from, from uh, Jeffrey's report <clears throat> that we're still talking about a town of about 20,000 people. Medford's population at the time was about the population of, Je of, uh, of, of Ashland or Central Point today. But according to Jeffrey's, we had trouble right here in River City. Yes, sir, we had vice right here with a capital V and that rhymes with P and that stands for Medford. Now, Jeffries did acknowledge that the brothels had been shut down before the war, but in Jeffries' survey, uh, 10 years later, all the taxi drivers were pimps, and he named the Holland Hotel, the Grand Hotel, and the rooms above South Front Street as the hotbed of illicit activity, and the problem was growing. Quote, harlots are increasing in Jackson County focusing much of their activity in cocktail bars and their activities are controlled from Klamath Falls, end quote. He didn't explain how Klamath Falls you know, figured into this and what the connection was there. But in Jeffrey's universe, fully 90% of Jackson County bar waitresses and cocktail girls were part-time prostitutes working in bars and taverns only to make contact with after hours clients. And during their shifts, they worked as, worked as shills, getting a kickback from drinks sold. He also claimed that he witnessed bartenders shortchanging patrons on multiple occasions. His eyesight must have been awfully good. And Jeffries named names, which I won't be reading out today. But you can read his report for yourself at the Historical Society. He singled out the Y Club as the worst offender though he used some of the mildest, his mildest language to describe it. I need to point out here that this Y Club is not the same, the organization at the same, by the same name at the YMCA. This one was a nightclub uh, located just north of the big Y, hence the Y Club, next, next to Dunham's Country Store. And I can't swear that it was the same building that Hungry Woodsman was in much later, but yeah. it's, it seems likely. According to Jeffries, the Y Club was, quote, brace yourself, a definite rendezvous for homosexual degenerates and prostitutes, narcotics addicts, peddlers, and pimps, end quote. It looks like they had some pretty good live entertainment, though, and including a fan dancer for, for New Year's 1949. But Jeffries reserved much of his contempt for what was then known as the shortest skid row in the Pacific Northwest, a half block stretch of South Front where some of these interior photos were shot four years previously, or two years previously, no, no, yeah, four years. Jeffries soberly reported that Front Street was, quote, the most vicious and damnable area of vice and corruption and illicit gambling, sale of narcotics, prostitution and revolting drunken debauch, sexual perversion and official collusion and graft in all of Southern Oregon. It's very toleration under obvious official protection in the, is the shame of Medford and an insult to the decent and law abiding citizenry of the community. Every cocktail bar, tavern, or beer parlor within Skid Row has its quota of prostitutes of the very lowest scum of the backwash of human degeneracy, as well as pimps, narcotic addicts, and peddlers, homosexual degenerates, drunken bums, ex-convicts, disreputable and criminal characters, and is the haven of harlots of the raw, silent night, carriers of syphilis and kindred venereal infections who resort to the various upstairs brothels for their nefarious activities. This skid row area of the city of Medford is known well to the habituants of the criminal world of the entire Pacific coast 
and is the mecca of attraction to the white slave and narcotic traffic and kindred vice and crime. End of quote. It looks nice, though. <laughs> These pictures were taken in the same establishments four years before Jeffrey's visit, if he actually visited them at all. Jeffries described the fourth wheel bar at 31 South Front as, quote, a definite rendezvous for the nauseous scum of humanity. Ex-convicts, pimps and procurers, and especially known for narcotic addicts and peddlers. Within the walls of the front wheel, pinball machine gambling is flagrant. Also from time to time, stud poker games and other illicit games are nightly in evidence. This establishment is resorted to by known professional gamblers and shills, and likewise has numerous cappers inveigling suspect, unsuspecting individuals into the games, and they're invariably swindled of their money. Particularly, the cappers make contact with many mill workers, loggers, and truckers, especially on their paydays. The usual procedure is to induce the player to have a few drinks of liquor, and ultimately, when in the right stage of intoxication, they're easily swindled. Bootlegging is in evidence. And I guess moonshine was still a thing in the late 40s, or certainly what Jeffrey says it, it was. Not even Kim's restaurant escaped scrutiny. Quote, no slot machines in evidence, no pinball machines in evidence, but strongly suspected of the sale of opium and heroin. <laughs> Indications are this establishment is connected with the ramifications of the Chinese lottery syndicate and that lottery runners are operating from the Kim establishment, end quote. Jeffries recorded that the Bohemian Club was, quote, resorted to by loggers, truck drivers, and a very low moral element of the laboring class, male and female, also by prostitutes, homosexual degenerates, pimps, narcotic addicts, and peddlers, and has been, been the scene of numerous brawls and usually of Friday, on Friday and Saturday nights, the entire atmosphere soon develops into the voluptuous sexual inclination and drunken bedlam of Billingsgate profanity, quite audible far into the street, end quote. The guy had a way with words. But Jeffrey's survey was a countywide survey of vice, so please forgive me if we stray outside the city limits of Medford, along with Jeffries, in the Gold Hill Tavern, quote, a secretly concealed slot machine is operated in the rear of the bar. The slot machine usually is concealed under the counter of the bar and is placed on top of the bar to known patrons and quickly concealed if a stranger enters. Gambling on pinball machines is very flagrant in the Gold Hill Tavern. This establishment is indeed a vicious bootlegging resort and the patrons are generally of a very low moral order. And on Saturday nights, prostitutes of the very lowest in sexual perversion frequent the place, along with disreputable characters, narcotic addicts, and pimps. The management is engaging in the illicit sale of narcotics. The entire atmosphere of the place, especially on Saturday nights, soon develops into a vexatious, revolting bedlam of drunken debauch with salacious aspects that soon disclose the upstairs hotel rooms are obviously being resorted to for the purpose of sexual relations, end quote. I can go on, but I'm only going to do one more. Valentine's Restaurant and Cocktail Lounge was a classic cafe on South Riverside in Medford. There it is. That's the corner of uh, Maine and Riverside and Valentine's. The arrow in the heart is pointing at Valentine's. And it didn't escape, escape Jeffrey's disgust. Quote, no, no slot machines and no gambling. Indications of the sale of illicit whiskey, which drinks over the bar, and these interior pictures are of Valentine's, resorted to by after-hours prostitutes and pimps and homosexual degenerates. It has been repeatedly observed during the course of the survey that the high class after hours prostitutes and the well-dressed and refined appearing homosexual degenerates invariably resort to the more pretentious establishments. And the same individuals are frequently observed in Valentine's. Birds of fine feathers, male and female, are usually found in the same atmosphere. 
As inconceivable as it may seem, homosexual degenerates and other sexual perverts are to be found in all professions and social positions in life, end quote. Surprise. As I said, it was a simple time, a carefree time, the days of Leva to Beaver and Father Knows Best. So I'm sure you've gathered so far that I'm not a fan of Walter Jeffries and his report on vice in Jackson County. Everywhere he looked, he found vice and always the same vices. Finding vice was what he was paid for, what he was hired for after all. But there are surprisingly few actual facts in his report. His report was 102 pages, 15 of which was index. But And reading his report on people's activities and comparing it with the time he had available and the opportunities he had to witness what he claimed to witness, I'm strongly suspicious that he made a lot of it up at the typewriter. The main difference from one joint to the next is the degree of vehemence by which he condemns it. So I've dug into Jeffrey's past and transcribed onto my site <clears throat> the newspaper reports of his activities for your reading pleasure from his burglary conviction in 1907, his first job after prison as a salesman, his self reinvention as a vice crusader in 1917. He soon began to be, build, him, build himself as a, 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 a vice crusader and a crime and police efficiency expert. But as early as 1918, the accusation was recorded in a San Bernardino newspaper that he was enjoying his, his work too much. Quote, he was probing vice conditions primarily for the pleasure of the sensational incidents encountered in his work, end quote. Despite multiple newspaper condemnations of his activities and, and techniques, if you wanted to to make headlines and a political name for yourself in California during Prohibition, you hired Walter Jeffries. He conducted bootlegging raids and what were called red light raids. He broke down a lot of doors in his career, made a lot of headlines, but put surprisingly few people behind bars. Her tactics were questionable and frequently outside the law, but that apparently wasn't bad for business. It just made more headlines. He was indicted for impersonating a federal officer in 1922, but that doesn't seem to have slowed down his career at all. A California newspaper outlined Jeffrey's business model, quote, it was a part of his plan to go to the mayor of the city where he proposed to work, present to him numerous credentials from the mayors of cities where he had been before, agree to work on a commission basis, and then lay out his plans for a systematic drive. As a rule, he would connive with certain men to plead guilty to bootlegging activities or bluff others into believing he was a federal officer. Then he'd advise the victim to go into court, plead guilty and pay a fine, of which Jeffries would receive a cut. Jeffries made it his business to pose as a morality expert, presenting letters and endorsements from ministers, mayors, and others in the cities where he'd worked. These coupled with his statements that he was a federal officer, deceived the municipal ex executives in many cities and resulted in a rich harvest for Jeffries and his Confederates, end quote. And it gets worse. I could forgive Jeffries for being a crook, but I can never forgive him for what he did to the English language. He loved creating meaningless phrases never before or since used in, Eng in the English language and then beating them to death with, re with repetition. To the continuant fact was one of them. Stimulus mediums, commercialized prostitutes, cultivative processes. He, these things mean nothing. He, started, he loved starting paragraphs with to the continuant fact, which means absolutely nothing. The passages I quoted from already, I had to edit a lot just so they'd be, they'd be intelligible. So we're going to sign off from Jeffries now. I'm going to, with, with one unedited sentence from his report taken from his conclusion. This is one sentence. Quote, to the continuant fact, 
the analytical recapitulation of all factual aspects of the functional ramifications of the Office of District Attorney, <laughs> inclusive of paramount essential requirements of implementation, legal and otherwise, especially as to structural office arrangement, appointments and floor space, and that of personnel complement and compensation, inclusive of the compensation of the district attorney and essential mediums of efficiency and systematization, stimulus of the application in true business administrative economy, discloses the status in quo of the office as approximately 15 years in its deficiencies, comparable with the progress and expansion of the civil community as of this current period. End quote. Got it? And his typing, without exception, he capitalized every single adjective and noun, the verbs he scrupulously left uncapitalized, commas and semicolons sprinkled liberally and randomly throughout. And whenever the fancy struck him, he'd shift his typewriter to the red ribbon or insert, insert a few extra word spaces. But happily, Jeffrey's report seems to have had no impact, impact at all. It was apparently put into a drawer in the district attorney's office where the original survives to this day and was then forgotten or almost forgotten. District attorney Nunley's opponent in his reelection campaign got wind of this secret report and did his utmost to make an issue of it, complaining about the $2,800 paid for it in secret. That's about $30,000 in 2022 dollars. The fact that Jeffries did much of his did all of his work and was paid for it under a phony name. He called himself J.P. Catting. That's why the headline says calls it the mystery of the Catting report. And the fact that a report paid for with public funds was kept secret. District Attorney Nunley's only public response to these charges was that it was important to keep Jeffries' report secret because it would quote lose its value if it were made public. End quote. Truer words were never spoken. Jeffries was 64 years old when he completed his good works in Jackson County, and he seems to have faded into obscurity immediately afterwards uh, and died in Los Angeles 10 years later. The Jackson County report was apparently his swan song in his crusade against vice. The only other survey we have on crime in Jackson County in the 1950s was repaired prepared by a guy named William P. Bell Jr. And his approach was completely different, probably only partly because his mission was different. Bell was hired in public by the city of Medford, not only to survey the crime situation, but to make recommendations toward reorganizing the Medford Police Department, which, which seriously needed it after World War II. The MPD of this era was a relic of an earlier time uh, Medford police weren't required to meet any educational or experience standards that I can find. They worked 48 hours, six days a week, and were paid less than mill workers. And like Jeffrey's secrecy, Bell's approach was public and above board. He spoke publicly before Medford public service organizations. His speeches were rep reported on in the press. His report, when it was issued, was widely publicized and quoted. Bell was a sergeant with the Berkeley Police Department and had been with them for 10 years. He was a graduate in criminology from the University of California and had been a special agent of the FBI. And he could write a coherent sentence. You can read his report too at the Historical Society Research Library. His report was 177 pages and he made up 100 recommendations for changes in the organization, procedures, and equipment of the Metroid Police, most of which were implemented the same year he delivered his report. In his report, Sergeant Bell was much more sanguine about crime in Medford, and his report presents actual statistics and actual facts, as, as opposed to Jeffrey's report. By Bell's count, in the six years after VJ Day in Medford, there were two homicides, three manslaughters, eight rapes, and three aggravated assaults in six years. He acknowledged that burglary was up 22%, but it was still lower than 84 cities of similar size on the West Coast. He could have pointed out that 
in a town of 20,000 people, all it takes is one professional criminal passing through town to make crime statistics fluctuate wildly. But alarmingly, theft was up 100% in this period to a level higher than the national rate, and auto theft was up 32%, but the trend was down. But in all of 1950, there was only one robbery in Medford, and there were six in, but there were six in the first half of 1951. He also drew attention to an unusually high drunk arrest rate, but pointed out that a third of the offenders gave Camp White addresses. Today, of course, we'd recognize that these would have been largely uh, untreated PTSD sufferers. Bill also had a much more sanguine attitude toward vice, which he defined as prostitution, narcotics, liquor, and gambling. He cautioned that vice is the weak spot in any city government and is the means by which government and law enforcement may become corrupted. But Bell concluded that there was no indication of a serious narcotic problem in Medford of 1951. He found the same social gambling that Jeffries did two years later, but uh, concluded and with, with a caution that there is no, quote, there is no evidence that this activity has affected the integrity of the municipal government and the police department. But the continued existence of tolerated violations of gambling is always a threat to the integrity of the police department and local government, end quote. Juvenile delinquency was a matter of growing concern in this period, but Bell pointed out that any growth in delinquency could be a matter of perception since the problem is intangible and difficult to measure. Uh, during fiscal year 1951, the files of the Medford Police Department indicated that 70 ju juveniles were involved with the police, but that included cases in which ju juveniles were victims. Which brings me to what I really want to talk about, which is what the kids were up to during the post-war period. Until the 1980s, when children began living under 24-hour surveillance, the world of childhood was a different universe that adults couldn't often penetrate. My generation was told to go outside and play and not expected home till supper time. And our photographs of children rarely show them as they really are. Too many of the, our pictures of kids at the Historical Society resemble this one. You know, scrubbed and standing in a row, aligned by height, squinting into the sun, thoroughly domesticated. <laughs> or appearing so, anyway. These are Frank Clark's kids, I, I guess posing by his house on West 11th Street. Or this picture, three boys groomed to within an inch of their lives, posing for the newspaper. One of them wearing a bow tie, for heaven's sake, clutching their Lindbergh banks. The banks were part of a promotion of the Medford Daily News. And if one of the people, if the people here would like to clutch a Lindbergh bank, I, I brought mine. So you can examine it after the talk. But if, oh, I could hold it up to the camera, couldn't I? Lindbergh. But we do have a, at the Historical Society a very few picture, pictures of children in their natural element. Like this picture, identified only as Noel, Dale, and Gordon on South Grape, circa 1925. And this one, from the first month of performances at the New Holly Theater in September 1930. A mob of wild, feral, unsupervised kids staring the camera down. It's like Lord of the Flies. I'd hate to go down a dark alley some night and run into 30 or 40 of these guys. But it's next to impossible for a historian to research the world of children. Reminiscences are usually rosy colored. Children don't make the newspapers often. So uh, we'll have to reach back earlier in the century to get an insight into what, what they were up to. One of the few circumstances when unsupervised children make the newspapers is when they act together as a gang. And yes, we had gangs right here in River City. But these gangs weren't like the Bloods or the Crips or MS-13. They were usually com composed of 13-year-olds. And they were usually more like our gang, you know, the little rascals. 
And these gangs go way back, you know, and uh, we have found gangs as early as 1901 and, and their activities usually involve, involve food. Food was often the target of early gang activity. In 1915, a gang of four Medford teenagers were in the habit of snatching milk bottles off porches, stealing chickens, and burglarizing grocery stores to get food for gang feasts. The Mail Tribune reported that all of, the Med all of Medford Boyville knew of the operations of the gang, but remained silent. According to the approved rules of gangland, as the paper described it. And of course, we've all, we all know the stories of uh, raids on watermelon patches and farmers with uh, shotguns loaded with buck salt, uh, uh, rock salt. That stuff really happened and really happened all over the country and happened here too. It's in the newspapers. Food raids seem to have been quite the thing for decades. In 1922, a group of Medford High School boys planned what they thought was a little innocent fun involving trespassing, housebreaking, and burglary. The boys got wind of a private party of fellow students on South Orange Street, and plans were made for a raid. They entered the back porch and unscrewed the fuses from the fuse box, you know, leaving the house in darkness, during which they escaped with the party refreshments, which had been left on the porch to cool. One of the gang was recognized in the getaway and he was reported to the police. The chief of police tracked him down, interrogated him, but the cake bandit didn't squeal. He was then taken to the district attorney's office and questioned further until he informed on the whole gang. The Mail Tribune didn't take the story as seriously as they could have, referring to the gang as the seven brothers of the snatch a bite -a pie fraternity. <laughs> they were taken back to the party where they apologized profusely and made good the loss of the delicacies. And of course, there were in situations of more serious nature, like, like the case of Henry Lurch, the secondhand dealer on North Front Street. The police described him as a Fagan, but the good old Mail Tribune called him a Fagan. He, enc he encouraged Medford teens to steal copper and brass for him, even offered to lend one of them a horse and wagon so he could go to Gold Ray Dam and steal from the stockpile of copper wire there. He allegedly taught them to burn the goods to make it harder to identify. The newspapers described a stream of boys in short pants who testified against him in court, but he was inexplicably acquitted. It's not explained why. Lack of evidence, I guess. Then there was the Ashland gang in 1938 of a dozen 13-year-olds who discovered that service station tills were easy to pilfer while the attendant was distracted. I hesitate to call them a gang, but what they were doing was organized crime. Of course, organized crime has quite a different connotation. These mobsters made their getaways by bicycle. <laughs> 13 seems to have been the perilous age. In 1940, Medford had a gang of 13-year-old counterfeiters molding lead nickels that they would sell to their friends. This gang was lucky to get away with just a stern lecture. Even more hilarious is the list of loot recovered from three Central Point boys, one 10-year-old and two 12-year-olds, who burglarized the Fireside Inn in town, in, in Central Point. They were found with the following, quote, one large bag containing a small chef's ladle, one door hasp, one, one barrel bolt, one comb, two knives, one corkscrew, one 1950 Teamsters AFL Local 962 badge, one roll of confetti, one jar of various sized nails, one lime squeezer, one spoon, one packet of personalized, personalized labels, a handful of rusty screws, one toilet tank float, numerous Y Club cherry cocktail picks, one bundle of wax paper, one cocktail shaker strainer, and one first national bank money bag containing two light bulbs and a seafood cocktail glass, end quote. But of course, these are all individual cases. Uh, so far, we just don't have data to speak authoritatively of, you know, like a historian should of, of trends and such. 
And when we do find figures from one year, we don't have comparable data from earlier or subsequent years to make comparisons. In 1948, the Mail Tribune did give us a rare report on juvenile delinquency in Jackson County, which the county's juvenile officer described as having reached serious proportions. With the worst cases of juvenile, juvenile delinquency developing in the so-called better homes of Medford, he reported on a current case of between 50 and 60 teenagers who, over a period of weeks, have been holding unchaperoned parties in homes where liquor flowed freely and repeated sex offenses have occurred, often after the girls have become intoxicated. So there's nothing new about this kind of stuff. The parents, the report stated, acceding to the wishes of the youngsters had spent the evenings elsewhere, leaving the parties unrestricted and unchaperoned. Because these children had been protected by parents and friends, reports of their mis misconduct didn't reach police nearly as soon as they would have had they occurred among children from poorer homes. It was only when some serious results developed, I don't know, pregnancies, that complaints were brought to the juvenile court and to the police. He pressed for the creation of a juvenile detention home. There wasn't one at the time pointing out that as many as 10 or 12 children are now held for weeks in the county jail before the court docket can be cleared sufficiently to hear their cases. So that's going to be the end of my talk with kids in the county jail. That brings us up to the carefree, happy 1950s. And so we bid farewell to Beaver and the Cleavers and the simple, happy times of the 1950s when cars had fins, the birds sang in the trees, and the sun shone every day, and everyone was happy except the kids in the county jail.